So our Anderson pillars for leadership are share success, drive change, and think fearlessly. And I'm wondering, I'd like to hear some examples from your own life that exemplify these pillars. Okay. On share success, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a credit giver. I'm a, I'm a profuse credit giver. I like to acknowledge people on my team, um, lift them up, and let people know who really um, is in the trench doing work. You know, um, I'm, I'm really lucky to have a wonderful team at the California Community Foundation, and they're the ones who day in and day out are on the ground with our nonprofit partners, asking tough questions, but creating cases that we take back to our board so that we can get grants authorized and get resources out um, to very needy communities. So just concretely, that's the way I like to share success. I also believe in, in putting money where the mouth is. And um, I, I am really proud that uh, at the end of 2014, I became a, a donor through the California Community Foundation and established a fund that I'm going to use to make my own grants to nonprofits. So I hope that my coin will share some resources with with a few nonprofits around town that I care about. Uh, drive change. Um, the, you know, it's a, a daily pursuit for me, and it's why I felt compelled to leave the for-profit sector to come into the social sector, the for-purpose sector. And it's, it's what I believe is, is necessary in a town like this, the second largest city in the country where we have, you know, look around, you can um, see more people living and sleeping on the streets than ever. Um, more students uh, maybe starting college but not finishing due to a whole host of reasons, financial, socio-emotional and so you know my daily work is right in the middle of that and I, I think that's critical um, so um, you know driving change is, is something that I I, I, I I try to do all the time and then the last is think fearlessly think fearlessly think fearlessly thank you <laughs> well um, when I left the for-profit world I, I remember that day it was the first week of January of 1995. I quit my job without another job. And it was because I knew that despite all the great education here at Anderson and at Yale before and had a great high school education as well, uh, that I wasn't living up to all the thing, all the advantages that I had through you know, my parents' hard work through these schools and to just um, accumulate wealth and live comfortably was just, just not going to be what I came here to do. So uh, living fearlessly for me meant uh, taking a real chance and not knowing how that story was going to play out. So I spent the majority of that year, 20 years ago, um, volunteering and uh, talking to a lot of classmates and reimagining my, my life and my life's work. And that's what led me into the nonprofit world uh, that I, I, I plan to retire from at some point. I think the 21st century version of living fearlessly really involves um, asking tough questions like, why shouldn't a social service agency or a, let me get really bold, why shouldn't the county probation department want to put itself out of business? Why, why wouldn't it want to do such a phenomenal job at redirecting the lives of these young folks who are in camps, get out of those camps and get into school and get into the workforce so that we could retool 
probation officers and they could go back to community college or college and become the chefs and the camera people and the directors that they dream to be. I think uh, living fearlessly means waking up and asking um, questions like why should the most industrialized nation in the world be the country that puts most people behind bars. We, sh we should not be able to sleep at night knowing those two facts coexist. Why did you decide on business school and why specifically Anderson for you? Well, I, being at Yale actually had a lot to do with that because by the time I graduated from college, I had been away from home seven years. And then I spent another two years in Chicago working. So by the time I got ready to go to business school, I was ready to come back to the West Coast. And UCLA made a phenomenal offer. And my mom, who I mentioned is a Bruin, uh, pretty much just laid down the gauntlet, like, we need another Bruin in the family. And you can move back home. I won't charge you rent come on and do this. And I was just like, I'm grown up, mom. I, why would I ever move back home to go to graduate school? Well, I ended up doing it and never regretted it. And Anderson, for me, you know, I, I'm happy to say that I was among the first of the real Anderson alumni because our first year was the year John Anderson made his gift, his $15 million gift, which I wonder what that would be in 2000. 15 terms is probably like 80 million dollars now, but um, it was a lot of money back then and, and still is is uh, a big gift and so uh, I'm really proud to to have that name uh, Association because I think this school has only gotten better since then. I know it's gotten better uh, You know the physical assets some of the same great professors are here and um, It's harder to get in so students like you are like you know, dream team members. So I am lucky to have gotten in when I did. What, from your experience here at Anderson, are there particular nuggets? That could, this could either be in the classroom or with friends that you met at Anderson. Is there anything that you can think of that really, for you, has, has special meaning today? It's always been about the people. The students, uh, Many of my classmates are still really close friends. We don't wait for the five-year reunion mark to see each other. And I think the, one of the blessings of now living in LA, uh, where so many alumni are concentrated, is it's easy to stay connected to other classmates. Uh, and then, you know, old professors. I, I subsequently worked here. Um, so that only added to the experience of of being on this campus in the Anderson School. So I, um, I, I think the greatest contribution, though, it made uh, was to my career in that I, in coming back to work here, I got to take all those B-School lessons and run a nonprofit, the Reardon programs, that are still here and bigger and better and brighter than ever. And um, that was the launch of, of the nonprofit track that I'm still on. But a, a lot of people would be frightened, though, to yeah. make that. You've got Pepsi and Nestle and what looks to be a trajectory going in one direction. <laughs> and a lot of people, I, honestly, a lot of people would get a little freaked out. Yeah. So how did you get beyond that? Sure. It helped to have a bonus <laughs> that I put in the bank from Nestle. But I knew, I mean, at the time it was, it was not that much money. It was maybe a little over $10,000 for an unknown amount of time, $10,000, $12,000. I, I started going to the cheap gas station. I, I cooked at home a lot, and I, I did a budget. This is going to sound very MBA-ish, but everybody will relate. I had a best, a worst, and a most likely case scenario, scenario budget, and I... I tried my best to live between the most likely and the best cases and to avoid at all costs the worst, which would have meant like selling my condo and couch surfing. But I was prepared to do that if that's what it was going to take to do what I felt I was called here to do.
What advice do you have for future leaders here at Anderson? When I reflect on 25, 26 years of uh, work and life, LA, New York, the Bay Area, uh, humility comes to mind as a, as a core theme because I've had some great victories, some great success. And yet the things that really have stuck with me have been the challenges and even failures. Uh, times where I, you, you, I've literally felt like humbled, maybe even humiliated. And those are the, those are the places where almost like compost you. You, you dig through it and you, you figure out what to take from it, what to replant for the future and say, I'm never going to do that again. Uh, or I'll repeat that, but maybe with an adjustment. So my advice to today's uh, Anderson students, leaders, future leaders, is, is to stay humble. And, and golf is a good way to do this if, if, if you're looking for a, a fun way to do it. Uh, while, you know, between, between or after work. Um, I, I would also say, uh, I, I love the, the think fearlessly pillar because I think that that really does speak to an Anderson spirit, that, that something about this campus, this school, this part of the world uh, is about daring and changing the rules even and, and reinvention. And so for me, when I think about these 26 years since graduation, uh, you know, I've reinvented myself. You know, I was a Pepsi marketer, you know, worried about you know, how we we're gonna beat Coke and you got the right one, baby, uh-huh. But I knew that wasn't where I was gonna hang my hat. I had to think more fearlessly about where the daughter of a retired school teacher and a retired clerk, court clerk should really Apply her trade, and for me, that has been in the sector that I think is where there's very, very tough work to do in in the nonprofit social sector. So, living fearlessly, thinking fearlessly, acting fearlessly is is about really believing that. I mean, this is going to sound cliche, but but um, living up to that that notion of being a change agent, and and realizing that we. We, yeah, we could come and, you know, make the six and seven and some people eight-figure salaries, uh, but realizing that that's just not enough. I, mean, I, I, you know, for seven years worked for Dick Reardon, a very wealthy, successful mayor who has dedicated himself to solving the problem of early literacy, and it was a real privilege for me to serve as the president of his foundation. He's a great friend of the Anderson School. And, and planted the Reardon programs here, and I, I, I see in people like him, people who are daring and are, refuse to be comfortable. And, and I think that that's, just, that's the obligation of all, all Anderson alums is to be successful, but for what? For the causes that are gonna change and improve California, the country, the world. That was fantastic.